Hello, and welcome back to Switch and Lever. So, I've been thinking about that phrase for some time, switch and lever. For a channel with such an iconic name, this sure has been a shortage of switches featured on screen. Well, aside from this, 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 and this. Over the summer, I visited a few flea markets and picked up a few switches in need of a little or a lot of TLC. So in one swift move, let's put the switch count into overdrive and restore these switches. This and this and this and that and this and that and this and this. First things first, how do we even know any of these switches are worth restoring? They could be completely dead and not switching at all. If you have a multimeter, you can simply hook up the leads in continuity mode to make sure that there is electrical connection through the switch. As you can see, and maybe hear, all the switches work at least to some degree. Though some connections are intermittent, which shows there is definitely some gunk or corrosion inside the switch. If you don't have a multimeter, you can hook up a battery and an LED in series with the switch and see if the LED lights up or not when flipping the switch. Once that's established, we're going to need to disassemble these switches into all their constituent parts. When you're working with many similar yet dissimilar items at once, it's important to keep good order so you don't mix parts between different switches. I really like these organizer boxes with removable individual compartments. Focus on getting as much apart as you can at first, even all the little screws and nuts, as it will make the following steps easier. Of course, realize when you're just about done that you chose too small of a box and trade up to something bigger. The nut and one of the contact screws on one of the switches was just not budging at all. Considering how corroded this switch is, it's likely seen some damp conditions and corrosion has thus crept into the threads. There are numerous ways to unstick stuck threads, but the first thing I always reach for is the trusted and fragrant WD-40. For this application I really wanted the WD-40 to get in there, so the whole switch went into a small cup and was doused liberally with WD-40. This was then covered to hinder evaporation and accidental spillage and left to soak for several hours. Even after soaking the nut was still very stubborn, but it was moving with some force using pliers. Since I didn't want to risk damaging the nut, the pliers were padded with several layers of paper towel in between and slowly backed out. Some of the switches are just held together with bent tabs of metal and they come apart very easily by just bending up the tabs. What is quite common though is that some switches are riveted together, and for that there really isn't any way around drilling out the rivets. Don't worry, we're going to find a way of putting them back together even so. As you can see, all the switches look ever so slightly different inside and deal with creating the toggle functionality slightly different as well. A couple of them uses a small bearing ball and others use a small cradle that swings back and forth. What is common with all of them though, except for the pull switch, is that there is a spring inside which holds tension on the toggle and which snaps over when you flip the switch. These two switches had the toggle part pinned into the top housing I did attempt to tap out the little pin, but on neither it wanted to move. Out of fear of damaging the switches, I left them in, even though it will make cleaning a little bit more difficult. For cleaning and getting these switches in tip-top shape, we're going to use a wide variety of tools. Our main tool will be using a Dremel with various brush and polishing attachments. I really like this small Scotch-Brite attachment for quick and easy surface cleaning. It's exactly like a scotch Brite pad, but in a handy Dremel form factor. For polishing, we'll use one of my favorite compounds, Autosol Metal Polish, which is great for getting a high shine on a wide variety of materials. 
To clean out all the gunk inside the switches, we'll use some contact cleaner and Q-tips. This is mostly isopropyl alcohol in a spray can, so by all means you can just use alcohol as well. The important part is that it cleans without leaving any coating or residue behind. Since a lot of these parts are small and difficult to hold, and we are going to use a rotary tool to work on them, it can help a lot to have a small hand vise to hold the parts when working. This small one I picked up at an antiques tool market, and it quickly became one of my favorite tools. The reason I'm using a brass bristle attachment to clean with is because the brass is softer than the material it cleans. It will eat away rust and dirt no problem, but the underlying steel surface will be mostly left alone. You do not need to apply a lot of pressure here, let the bristles work for you. It's really really nice to see it almost just magically melt the corrosion away, leaving clean base metal underneath. You can really see the difference from one side to another on the parts as I'm working on them. Now there are a couple of other downsides with these bristle brushes. Just like the scotch Brite attachment, they wear out very quickly. However, they are also very cheap, so if you buy them, get a couple of dozen of them at once, so you don't run out in the middle of a job. The second issue is related to the first. Because they lose bristles, those bristles tend to be shot away at quite some speed. So work with safety glasses and be aware that you may be picking prickly bristles out of your hair and skin once the job is done. The plastic toggles don't really need any work done, save for one. One of the toggles were covered in this chipped green paint. It was carefully and with very very light pressure mostly cleaned off using the scotch Brite attachment. As it is plastic, you want to be very careful building up any sort of friction which may melt the plastic. With everything cleaned up, let's bring some life back into these now rather dull surfaces. Autosol metal polish is mostly used by hand, but it's also excellent to use with mechanical polishing. You want to apply a very light coating on the polishing wheel, and be aware that as you turn it on, any excess may spray away from the wheel at first. Though what's left on will last for quite some time, but you can of course reapply as needed. I'm polishing basically all visible surfaces, including the toggles, the top of the toggle switches and the nuts. Polishing like this will leave polishing compound covering the parts. You can of course wipe away most of it with a soft rag, but a nice spraying of the contact cleaner will help greatly to get the compound out of the hard to reach places. Just take a look at that hardware, we sure have come a long way already. But hey, remember that green painted plastic toggle? What can we do about that? Well, I wouldn't use any mechanical polishing, as it will likely build up too much heat. There is another product though that I absolutely swear by for doing this kind of polishing, and that is Micromesh. It's basically a type of sandpaper, but with a much more crystalline grit than regular sandpaper, and it comes in grits up to 12,000. The way you use it is by starting at the lowest grit and working your way up through the grits, taking care to get rid of all the scratches from the previous grit before moving on. Here I use the lowest grit, 1500, to clean up all the dirt and scratches still left on the switch, before moving on to 1800 and onward step by step up to 12,000. Once done, you can really see what a high shine we managed to create, with just a little elbow grease. So before we can put all the switches back together again, we have one more problem still to solve. One of the switches had a large chunk missing out of the backlight housing. While you could leave this open and the switch would likely work anyway, I don't like leaving jobs half done. 
So the way we're going to fix this is with some super glue and baking soda. Don't you worry, it will all make sense in a bit, I promise. First of all, we're going to need something to fill the void where the piece knocked out. This is a small piece of phenolic resin from an old circuit board. Circuit boards are often made from glass fiber, but older and especially cheaper one-sided boards are usually made from phenolic resin. What's good is that phenolic resin and bakelite are chemically very close, and they're both hard and accept superglue very well. The phenolic piece was shaped roughly to fit the hole left in the bakelite, and the bakelite was also ground away slightly to afford for a better fit. We're not going to make it fit 100% with a super tight glue seam though. What we are after here is enough contact surfaces, two or three points maybe, where we can hold down the piece with just a small dab of super glue. Now, it still has huge gaps, and the little glue we applied isn't going to hold for much. However, if we seal the back with some tape to prevent leakage, we can fill the coarse open seam with more super glue. Once it's filled, all we need to do is sprinkle some baking soda on top. I know it sounds kind of weird, but together they will form a pretty strong and gap-filling plastic. It dries almost instantly, so just wait a few seconds and brush away the excess baking soda. You can apply more super glue and repeat if there are still areas you feel did not get filled properly. And that's really all there is to it. Now just use your favorite tools, like a belt sander, small needle files and sandpaper to shape the phenolic piece and glue to blend in with the rest of the housing. A neat trick if you want to flush up a piece that's sticking out like this is to put some tape down on top of some sandpaper and only sand the piece outside the tape. This won't work on very coarse grit sandpaper as the grit will poke through the tape, but it should work just fine on anything 180 grit and above. Also remember to make sure that the switch contact will fit into its new housing. You could definitely now paint it all black if you really wanted it to blend in. I like honest repairs though, and since this is not something that will be normally seen, I will leave it exactly like this. Finally, it's time for the trickiest part of this whole restoration, the reassembly. Since toggle switches have a spring inside, they are naturally loaded, which means that you need to align all the parts inside and hold it together with reasonable force as you're bending the tabs over. If you slip or anything goes misaligned as you're doing this, you just have to start over. The frustration is definitely worth it though once the switch goes back together properly and you get to feel that tactile toggle once again. If for any reason you lost track of what goes where inside the switch, it can be a really good idea to take some photos as you're disassembling to reference now during the reassembly phase. There was one switch that we drilled out rivets on where the rivets actually fit an M2 screw perfectly, even without the countersunk head sticking up. This switch was just screwed together using nylock knocking nuts to prevent it ever coming undone and the excess length of screw cut off. Alright, just two more switches left, both with more drilled out rivets. Unfortunately, we cannot use the same method as on the previous switch, but we can do something else. These are small M2 threaded inserts that's normally used for thermosetting into plastic. Unfortunately, due to their size and their properties of Bakelite, we can't just melt them into the housings. However, we do have access to epoxy glue. Just mix up a little of your favorite 5 minute epoxy and carefully glue the inserts into place. Do take care not to get any glue into the threads of the insert for obvious reasons. This won't create the strongest glue up in the world, but it will be enough to keep the switch together. While the glue cures, we can turn our attention to the top plate of the switches. Since we want our screw heads to sit flush with the plate, we need to countersink the hole slightly. Just use a drill bit and carefully create a countersink. As the material is thin, you want to go slow and make sure you're not accidentally creating a hole that's too big for the screw. Once the epoxy is fully cured, we can finally reassemble our last two switches. 
It's nothing more special than what we did before, except that now we're inserting screws as we're holding everything together rather than crimping tabs. While these switches are all panel mount switches, there is no reason why you couldn't interface them with circuit boards and digital technology. Like this LED badge celebrating the 5th year anniversary of PCBWay. PCBWay is a great online service if you're ever in need of circuit boards. Why mess around with complicated layouts on breadboards which more resemble tangled Christmas lights than any sort of circuit when you can order custom made circuit boards for cheap from PCBWay. These are some boards I recently had made up for an upcoming project. Just look at their colorful awesomeness. Now with all the switches restored we can't... What? What's that? Levers? Do you think for a second just because this channel is called switch and lever I have to... Uh, okay. Uh, fi fine. Levers it is. <clears throat> this lovely old lever switch was nowhere near as far gone as any of the other switches I just restored, but pretty much all the same steps were followed in its restoration. Disassemble into all its individual parts, remove old solder and remnants of wire, cleaning and polishing and wiping everything clean with contact cleaner before reassembly. Happy? Do you like that? The switch and lever story is now complete. Now the question is, with all these restored switches, how do we best make sure that they all work properly? We could definitely hook them up to a multimeter and check continuity like we did before restoring. But maybe there is another... I hope you enjoyed this very on point episode from Switch and Lever. Do check out some other videos, follow on Instagram, and pick up some choice Switch merch from the online store while you're at it. Until next time!